we were talking about pharma representatives, but we think it's better if we don't full, if we are not so full up here, and you stay in the back, and you can always tell us what you are thinking about the, thing, uh, the discussion we are talking. Yvonne, I would like to start to ask you, how are you involved in all these trials? What's your job? Thank you. Um, so as um, part of the multidisciplinary team at GUYS, obviously there are two clinical nurse specialists, but we're lucky enough to also have our own clinical trials team that also have their own um, nurses as well. Um, when the patients um, move from our care to clinical trials, we will still be their key worker. So as a specialist nurse, whilst they will still be under the trials nurses, we will also be involved in their care. Um, and, you know, they're very welcome to contact us as well. You know, bearing in mind, we've got quite, usually got quite an in-depth knowledge of that patient already. You wouldn't just be cutting the cord and sending them down the corridor to the trials. So we do stay involved. And how many trials are you running at the moment, clinicians here? What can you tell us? <laughs> so at the moment, in, in uh, I'll speak for Israel, we don't have any active clinical trials in myeloproliferative neoplasms at the moment. However, um, a lot of the compounds that Claire referenced in her talk um, are going to be in clinical trials starting from the first quarter of 2020, uh, including the CARTOS product, product for myelofibrosis and for polycythemia vera, Givinostat, uh, Picritinib, and Momolotinib, which I don't think we mentioned specifically. So we're actually very encouraged by that. We're going to have um, almost the entire spectrum of drugs for myelofibrosis after failure of uh, first-line JAK inhibition, um, and also, excitingly, a first-line drug for polycythemia vera, which will be nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Germany, um, we have, it's very similar. Um, except that we, we do have um, in investigator-initiated trials, as I showed, one for myelofibrosis, um, trying to um, counteract the anemia by um, combining roxolitinib with um, a drug, uh, pomalidomide, which um, with, uh, strengthens the red cells in patients with uh, myelofibrosis. And we have another trial that um, uh, Claire alluded to, uh, where we look at uh, roxolitinib versus best available therapy in PV patients that haven't been treated yet. So it's a first-line treatment there. Um, I think it's an important study because we don't know how well um, this works in patients that haven't been pre-treated and are not re resistant to hydroxyurea. And also um, there's a, um, the same trial is open for ET patients, but they can be either um, uh, newly diagnosed or um, have um, uh, pre-treated uh, ET, and then we have additionally um, industry-sponsored trials. Uh, the CARTOS trial is open for PV and NMF, and other trials um, are shortly uh, will be coming. Our, last, uh, our section is called Patient Reported Outcomes and Patient Engagement in Clinical Trials. Do you have special wishes? How could patients be involved? And you have special ideas as a clinician and as a nurse? That's important for us, for only patients are sitting down here. Yeah, maybe I can start because um, the initiated trials that we uh, have from our uh, study group, um, they include um, patient-reported outcomes, um, quality of life assessment, and an MPN-SAF symptom scoring. 
Um, and the important thing is uh, here, I think that we are combining our registry with these uh, studies because uh, the um, studies only go for on for two to a max of three or five years. And then um, we, are, uh, we would lose the data afterwards. Um, but we are uh, then combining these uh, clinical studies with our bioregistry to keep going and see what are the uh, other, other endpoints that we can show that are um, uh, effectively um, uh, um, improved. And for this, we really need funding. That's uh, something um, that we haven't really talked about. Um, I think these large registries um, uh, cost a lot of money to uh, be documented and uh, to, uh, um, for the uh, individual um, persons that um, uh, keep the uh, registry. So um, I'd be happy to know um, how the registries are funded in other countries. So, um, in, in terms of invest investigator-initiated trials and patient involvement um, in Israel, we don't, we're not doing any prospective studies at the moment. What we are doing is a combination of uh, running a registry for the three MPNs that we've been discussing, um, and also doing a large uh, epidemiological study with one of the HMOs, the second largest HMO. Um, and I was happy to be able to involve Giora, who, who I think is here in, in that study, uh, one of the reasons is to try and see not so much about patient outcomes, but also patient input as to how patients are captured in general in general practice. One of the things we learned, for example, was if we want to look at doses of hydroxyurea that are prescribed electronically um, by physicians. So one of the points that were brought up was that in, in order to make things simpler for patients, sometimes a higher dose is prescribed in the compute by the computerized uh, methodology, so patients don't have to come back every three months for their refills, rather every four or six months. So, Clearly, that's going to give us a bias in terms of dosing that patients may be receiving of hydroxyurea. One of our first eye of interest is hydroxyurea um, resistance and intolerance in polycythemia virus. That was a very important point that we probably wouldn't have realized existed if it wasn't for a patient present on the steering committee. I think Prof has pretty much covered um, most of the trials that we have um, at Guys, um, and obviously she's mentioned that we rely quite heavily on... For I think 
that will enable patient health to me that's always one of the big things. I think there's one issue here that um, um, people will come to us and they will want to be on trial but you do have to remember that actually we are going to enroll them it might, it might be quite intensive there might be quite a lot of visits to hospital and, and sometimes people are actually generally not well enough to do that. They live too far away, it's not going to work for them. So I think we also have to take that into account as well as the fact that the numbers might be right. And also you also have to know, are they mentally going to be able to go with being on top? So I think that's another factor that we can be taking into account as well. Yeah, I think one way of um, maybe <clears throat> addressing this in the future would be to um, set up satellite sites around the big centers. Um, but apparently this is not so easy, um, easily done. But I think for legislation that, that would be really, that would facilitate um, uh, to conduct trials and, and uh, recruit patients. So the way we typically do this, because we don't have the possibility yet of opening uh, satellite sites, is that we use um, our databases um, to identify uh, patients for a clinical trial beforehand um, by looking at exclusion and inclusion criteria. And um, that way we can estimate um, a rough number um, of patients in Germany, for example. But I um, totally agree with you. I think um, the exclusion criteria are um, uh, getting to an extreme point where it's um, more likely not to include a patient than to include it. And, uh, this should be revised. <coughs> so, uh, the, uh, there's no question about the lot of patients. Uh, they are very keen uh, to know about this. You know, we would like to know what trials are available. Uh, and we are hoping that the news in the last trial uh, gets uh, many more uh, I think the exclusion uh, rate, I think this is accepted by most of the patients. You know, we know that several conditions uh, you know, uh, that are obvious. Okay. Now, I was just going to you know, question, uh, can we not use as a label a network in the airport where we can have a special um, certain place or a place or several where we can release um, uh, and test the public? Would it be possible to say that we did that here that clinicaltrials.gov and all of its like very glory, with all of the detail. I really think, to I think it was Martin's point um, about the just about all of the um, the information that patients have to digest and understand to make that decision. 
I think we try to make it as concise as possible for patients. But something that we have run into, which is a negative of trying to publicize clinical trials, which is a really important principle for us, is sometimes patients read the, um, the good news about trials and the positive data, and they think that it is right for them, and they are very convinced of it, even to the point of defying their doctor who you know, has like the information about their actual case. And so for us, it's really important for us to kind of walk a line of saying, yes, this is really optimistic, great stuff, but please temper your optimism with a little bit and, and please trust your doctor. So I would say that's the way that we do it at the foundation, and I don't know if other advocates have encountered a similar sort of line to walk, but that happens pretty frequently where we have to kind of like hear their um, issues with that. May I answer? I was at a meeting and they told us in Netherlands everybody wants to go into trials. In Germany nobody wants to go into trials. And what's your experience and what could we do be as advocates? How could we push? How could we find more people? Yeah, I see the danger of um, uh, maybe overestimating uh, um, innovative drugs and um, uh, it seems that we have more uh, innovative drugs than we can actually, than we have patients sometimes. So um, they have to be tested and then um, weighed against uh, the standard. And I still think that it's, uh, it's um, absolutely necessary to go through the uh, local doctor and maybe uh, an expert in addition. Um, and, but the impulse can very well come from the patients. That's very important. I think there's a role for advocacy and education, so you point to out that clinical trial is a sort of risk. Taking what's in a clinical trial has some elements of risk, and that uh, we're doing a trial precisely because we don't know if the, if the thing that we're testing is better. And we have to remember that, actually, um, not everyone is uh, very eloquent, not everyone is very good at reading, and um, of course the patient will always have a point of thinking that wants to go. But it is not always in a clinical trial. So I think mean, something about you know, some tech, some balance, and you know, as a clinician who often knows patients as well, I wonder about in just widening this conversation a bit further and because we do have pharmaceutical representatives in the room to ask them about how would they see the involvement of patients and again maybe Michelle you could comment about your experience with the FDA because I think that our regulatory agencies don't always take the patient they don't always take the clinician into uh, account when there are these discussions. So I think as you learn to share, just want to talk to you. Does somebody want to answer from the pharmaceutical side? Maybe Chris or Jim? So, uh, sorry, it's the microphone's not working, so I hope, hope you can hear me. Um, so I'm Louise, I'm with Patient Advocacy at Novartis, and we're working on a number of initiatives to systematically include the patient voice in our clinical trials, because I think at the moment, it's done in a bit of a spotty way. It's getting better, but it's not a systematic um, you know, integration at the moment. So we're working in a number of cross-industry <coughs> initiatives to ensure the systematic integration. In the meantime, our global colleagues have launched something called GOPIP. It's a short acronym for something that stands for Global Oncology Patient Insight Panels, but the short form is GOPIP. This was launched about 12 months ago. And in the, these are actually patient panels that start to working with us early on in the clinical development process. And in, in just, I would say, 12 months, um, we've had uh, in integration of the patient voice in 12 different disease areas, looking in 39 different clinical trials. So 
Um, is it perfect? No. Um, is it moving ahead? Yes. Are we progressing? Yes. But the key, key thing is going to be systematic integration, um, which is what we're trying to do now across our clinical development team. And may I add to that, if I have another second? Um, so Louise uh, described perfectly the model of the go -pip, and uh, we are learning, right? And some of the interesting things that we are finding out is that as much as we want to include patients in everything that we do, there are certain rules that are not Novartis established rules that may not always allow us to do so. So when Novartis and other pharmaceutical companies develop a trial, we have to follow a fairly strict and rigid process established by the regulators, right? And uh, in some instances, when we do want, for well, the patient community wants us to change a certain aspect of a clinical trial, we may not be able to do that. So this is just to illustrate the complexity of this process because, yes, on the surface, I think we all want the same thing. We want to make sure that the trials are developed in a meaningful way, that the treatment that's being tested brings value to the patient. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that it's more difficult that we had anticipated than in the beginning of that process. And I'm certain that the community and the advocates that we're working with also start to realize that it may be more than just reviewing a protocol design document or providing uh, feedback on the informed consent form. It's actually, it will require all of us here to start looking at things like uh, PRO measurements, right, and which ones are actually fit for global clinical trials because there is this whole debate about the ones that are being used versus not being used and developed by the patients for the patients. But are they fit for global clinical trials? For a global company, we must use the validated instruments that are translated in all the languages, that are accepted and validated in all the countries. So another example of like, I don't want us to oversimplify it. I think, yes, we all agree on the principles, and I think we still have a way to go. It's not going to be done in another 12 months. I think it's a multi-year process that we need to go through together, hopefully. I'm going to stand up just so you can hear me. So just to follow up on Claire's request, I would talk about this initiative with the FDA that she's referring to. So um, this September, um, here is the foundation in collaboration with other partners actually in the room, such as David Wallace and Amy Lane from uh, LLS. We actually had a meeting with the FDA, and the whole focus was to bring the patient perspective to the FDA. And this was born out of uh, concern on our part that they weren't uh, understanding or embracing all of the things that we heard from patients were the most meaningful. And some patients, they're very concerned about, um, you know, transfusion dependence, or they're very concerned about their just their physical symptoms, or they're really concerned. You know, sometimes they're concerned about the things that the drugs on the market are hitting, and sometimes they are not. And so, what we wanted to do is present a comprehensive view of the patient experience. And the goal would really be for them to then have that in their mind as they're looking and working with the sponsors for the creation of endpoints that um, would be meaningful for the trial. And so for us, that meeting finished in September, and what we're doing now is working on the report so that we could say, okay, well, this is what the patient said. We'll present it to the FDA. But then to really work towards changing their thinking on it, we're going to be looking as an advocate community, again, in partnership with the other people who helped us with this, and say, well, where are the gaps? Like, are patients saying that this is the most important thing? And does the FDA agree? And if they do, how do we measure it? And this is, to caveat that, like, this is not our business. Our business is working with patients as advocates. So this is a learning process for us. And so I think this is actually a partnership opportunity between us and pharma because you guys know the regulatory environment because you interact with them vastly more than we do. And we only got to this point because you were, like, jumping up and down in anger every time something happened when we didn't like, but not knowing how to navigate the system. So you know, this is this is how we're approaching it, but I think that we can still do more and again learn from each other and learn from how we you know develop the other contacts. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. yes, I, I was at the same meeting. Thank you, Michelle. It was a great meeting, and I think you know Ruben Mitch was there on the panel, John Masterinus, and I thought what was one of the other interesting point about endpoints was the fact that they stressed to the FDA that once they hear from the patients that MF 
and other NPN you know, diseases are very heterogeneous, even within PV, ET, or even M MF, right? Whether you're a first line patient, a very mild polyp with high platelet counts, or a second line patient, or even a low platelet population, that the endpoints of the 35% spleen bond reduction or the 50% improvement in CSS may not be the right goalpost for the heterogeneity of these types of uh, NPNs. And I think that was the, the big thing that there's clinical benefit that is being seen that you may not be hitting those same 35 and 50% that were established. And it was really interesting that, you know, Root and Mace was out developed these, you know, parameters said it was very arbitrary how we came up with these numbers. I'm sure Claire, you know that. And, and, and then, so they really stressed to the FDA that, you know, guys, drugs are not getting approved as a result because we're putting these signposts that were, you know, developed for one set of patients and we're planning to across this whole heterogeneous, heterogeneous, heterogeneous patient population, and that may be holding back some drugs down as well as a result. So I thought that was really good too. Thank you very much. Can I just follow up on one more thing from the industry perspective. First of all, I want to elevate the conversation to the global level because actually the approach that Michelle just spoke about and Jim just spoke about is very US centric in terms of the science and patient input. And I've not seen that with the EMEA. There's, a, there's definitely a lot of patient engagement, involvement, but there are different approaches. I think that what Alexi said is right, we have a long way to go, but I think the place we can all start now working together very closely is when it comes to the pragmatic aspects of making a clinical trial, the experience of participation all the way from consent all the way through to sharing results, a more patient-centric approach. So these patient panels that Louise was mentioning, I think that's a place right now where, you know, in the U.S. and at the global level, we can work with patients to test certain concepts within protocols and see is, is that going to be a deal breaker for patients? I mean, right now, like this idea around endpoints, the FDA is just a few years into many guidances that talk about how to incorporate the kind of feedback that Michelle was able to gather through this meeting. So that is a little more, like, far-reaching. It's coming, but then I think working on making the trials a better experience, work, we can do that. Thank you very much.